Well, I actually chose the BGC uh, initially as a master's student because I wasn't sure I wanted to pursue a, a doctorate at the time. And I didn't have a master's, and um, so it just made sense that I start here as a master's student. But I was coming from a curatorial career at the Museum of Modern Art in the architecture and design department. And I had been there for eight years. I had been toying with the idea of trying to get a degree part-time while I was curating. And um, this program was always tempting me, but it took me a while to finally dedicate myself to it. And I decided, you know, if I'm going to advance myself in, in curatorial work, I really need an advanced degree. So um, I quit working at the museum and came here as a student full time. There are lots of programs that have architectural history components and they're usually packaged in with art history departments or architecture departments. Um, but there's very few programs in the United States that deal with uh, design. So this is one of the few and its reputation has been growing consistently, other than the Cooper Hewitt, maybe, and a few design specialists that are in history departments or American studies departments, or occasionally art history. Um, this is the only institution that has that focus. You're exposed to a faculty that are coming from a lot of different disciplines. I mean, this is a pretty new field, studying design, design history, material culture. And it's been formed by all of these people who, who come from different backgrounds and different niches. So we've got anthropologists, we've got American studies, we've got historians, we've got art historians, um, we've got design historians proper. And I think all of them bring a particular angle to the way that they look at objects. And each of them have, of course, their historical period that they're interested in, uh, types of objects. But it's, it's really broad. and. Um, I think if you're interested in buildings, if you're interested in cities, this is a place where you can pursue those things. If you're interested in teaspoons and porcelain, this is a place where you can pr pursue those things. Landscapes, um, any sort of objects that, that, that people uh, take into their lives and, and make meaning out of, it's fair game. I've been forced to encounter objects I normally wouldn't have. I move away from the dinner set or the couch or the chair and, um, or, the, or the poster or, or the book, printed materials. Um, I remember in one class with Catherine Whalen, it was uh, Amer American Material Culture Studies, um, our final project for the term was to go to a fish market. And we were treating the fish market as um, a place to encounter objects, in a sense, and the object was going to be a fish. <laughs> and this was so far from the kind of manufactured thing that you normally think of when you, when you think of design, and I think it made a lot of students scratch their heads, but um, it was a really great way to kind of blow the boundaries up and just approach something um, with fresh eyes. And um, for my project, we, we worked in teams, which is also really rare. It seems so often in academia, you're forced to work almost like a monk in a cell, you know, reading all the time and writing all the time. But this was a collaborative project with a, with a multimedia dimension to it. We were making a film, as well as writing about it. But um, we, we uh, were encouraged to be very experimental. And uh, we chose the oyster as our subject. And there's a whole canon of work that has been written about the oyster, from histories right here in New York of its production in Jamaica Bay and how uh, New York was called the Big Oyster, actually, before it was called the Big Apple. You get those sorts of histories from the 19th century and the disappearance of the oyster due to industrialization and pollution of water. Um, but we also approached the oyster in terms of an object that has a kind of uh, life cycle. Um, it goes through a production phase where it's harvested and, and put through a cleaning, a distribution where it goes to market and eventually ends up in the hands of a consumer who then prepares it and turns it into a dish. It enjoys the same sort of process that any sort of manufactured good does. And to make those kinds of parallels to any kind of material, even a fish, um, really made you think about material culture in its broadest sense. And I, I think that that project really made me uh, kind of open my eyes to, to new ways of, of thinking about things. Intellectually, academically, it's really kind of opened my eyes to working in new ways. I've become 
a much better reader, <laughs> read much more broadly now, and um, a much better writer, obviously. I mean, you have to really practice. And um, I think that I've, I, I approach projects with a, a much more open mind. Of course, I'm trying to kind of professionalize myself in this field of scholarship and publish and go to conferences and all of those kinds of things. But um, I think that I'm also trying to find new ways of doing things. And I think that's something that the BGC has really encouraged and fostered. And it feels like a gift that we have the, the, the um, Media Lab in that we, we do our courses on wikis and just being kind of digitally savvy and being able to produce a wiki or produce digital presentations beyond PowerPoints um, is really, I think, a skill that a lot of people will want and will need going forward. Uh, digital publishing is also something that, that they're doing here. So I think all of those things you can take away and they're, they're really valuable, <laughs> really valuable gifts. You're, if you're at all inclined for curatorial uh, or museum field, um, this is a great place to be. Um, but if, uh, likewise, if you're more interested in being kind of a classic academic or a historian, this is also a great place to be. Um, it, it really it gives you that kind of leniency and, and, uh, and uh, freedom. <laughs>